Well, folks, I have returned from the depths of hell to bring you this, an HP Omnibook, back when HP was known as Hewlett Packard. And uh, this computer is quite revolutionary. It was a Windows Pentium sub notebook. Um, those three words in the mid 90s would get most executives salivating at the thought of such a machine. You got to remember, the dawn of the Pentium was just in full swing back then, and and uh, getting a Pentium into a laptop, let alone a sub notebook, um, was a feat for the ages, because the earlier Pentium chips were power hungry and hotter than hell, and uh, when it, when sub notebooks, which were a class of laptop that predated the uh, netbook by, by, by about a decade or so. Uh, the, the concept of a sub-notebook uh, or a netbook um, has been around for almost as long as there have been laptops. Um, but the truth is, earlier sub-notebooks were underpowered, um, battery life was terrible, the internet wasn't really a thing then, so they weren't called netbooks, you know. Um, but yes, early netbooks were basically underpowered miniature versions of laptops. Laptops that were underpowered miniaturized versions of desktops. So the compromises were evident. Um, for example, sub-notebooks, in order to qualify for the, for the title, they had to be stripped down of everything that wasn't necessary. So no, ex no optical or magnetic drives of any kind other than the internal hard drive. I'm going to qualify that even further. Even hard drives were still um, were not necessary. For example, I'll bring you the Toshiba T1000. The Toshiba T1000 did not have an internal hard drive. It had an internal flash drive. But it wasn't truly a sub notebook because it had a floppy drive as well. Um, I'm jumping around a little bit only because I'm on a lot of caffeine. Mmm. Caffeine. All right. So sorry for the the jumpiness. One of the other early sub notebooks was the um, Gateway Nomad from the early '90s, back when Gateway was not only a company but a good one. The Gateway Nomad uh, was a compact laptop, much like the HP Omnibook, that, if I recall, did not feature a floppy drive, especially in no way in hell did it feature a CD drive. But another machine that's in that general bracket is the Toshiba Libretto, which was a very, very compact sub-notebook. The IBM, um, IBM made a laptop with a butterfly keyboard that was in the sub-notebook genre. But generally, sub-notebooks were the darling of businessmen, especially traveling ones, and women, of course. They would nicely fit on an airline table tray, um, allowing the user to access and manipulate their files on the go. Um, they were great to carry to meetings, they didn't take up a lot of desk space, um, and they generally had better battery life than their full, da full laptop counterparts. And they were lightweight, they could fit in a briefcase. They could fit in a pocket if you wore Jinko jeans. Um, so, this particular example is from the mid-90s. I would estimate about 1996 or 7. It features an Intel Pentium 133 processor, a 1.3 gigabyte hard drive of unknown make at this time. It features 32 megabytes of RAM expanded from 16. So it has the optional factory memory expansion card. It has a built-in pointing device, which unfortunately is why I give this laptop a complete failing grade in usability. We'll go over that in a little bit. It's running Windows 95 plus the original factory build. It's never been formatted. What's unusual about this laptop is it features a SCSI port. I'm not sure if it's SCSI 1 or 2. I don't think it's SCSI 3. Um, I, I actually, I used to know my SCSI ports, and there were many of them, tell, trust me. Uh, SCSI is a, is a connectivity technology that was very fast, 
very fast and mostly used on commercial or business machines, uh, except for Apple that use SCSI on everything. But SCSI was a high-speed connectivity port. Um, in this case, it was used for docking, I believe, and it was also used for the external CD-ROM drive option. It also features an external port for the floppy drive, which I don't have. Um, but this is a proprietary port that will only work with the HP supplied accessory. Um, it does feature a parallel port, 9-bin serial, and VGA out. Because this particular machine has onboard or integrated business audio, it features on the other side here, we have headphones, sound in, or line in, and microphone. This is one feature that got me baffled a little bit. It must be for an HP proprietary accessory, perhaps. But it features a Type 2 uh, PCMCA slot. But there's actually two of them. The second one is hidden by this removable module. If I unclip it... Now, I haven't seen any of the literature for this machine, so I, there's a lot of stuff that I, I, I don't quite get as to why they did it this way. But this has to be pulled out, and it looks like it's just a blank, a very well-made one. And that opens up the port or the, uh, the, the bay here for two Type 2 slots or one Type 3. I don't know why they did it this way. It's got me baffled. But my thought is there may be an accessory that actually locks in like that. Like perhaps a, uh, a special Zircom style um, uh, network jack or something like that. Network interface. Memory expansion is accessed under this little pull door. Like most in, or all laptops of the mid-90s, this one features a proprietary memory expansion card. Uh, this has the 16 meg option. I'm sure there was a 32 meg expansion as well, giving it a whopping 32 as it sits. There's 16 is on board. You know this is a business machine when it has a business card holder built right in to the, to the uh, bottom of the case. So you could just slide your business card right in there. Did I say business? I meant business. It's tired. It's I'm tired. Now I'm getting tired. Oh man. Ah oh, jeez. Okay. So let's get on with this. Business card goes in here so that way if the machine's ever lost, um, someone will call your number and hand deliver it um, with free lunch on a perfect day and sell it on the black market on a bad day. You know. Batteries right here. Just undo these two clips. And the battery pops right off. Now this is an original HP battery. It doesn't weigh that much. It's actually lighter than I thought. It must be a nickel metal hydride. No, it's lithium ion. 7.2 volt, 2.7 amp hour. Uh, the battery still remarkably holds a charge, but not for long. I mean, it will run the machine for about 20 minutes. And uh, that's not too bad, actually. <laughs> it's got a few bad cells. I bet I could have this pack rebuilt if I if I really wanted to. So, as I was saying, I got this laptop from a coworker who's been hanging on to it, teasing me with it for years. He was going to sell it to me about five years ago for thirty bucks, but I said, you know, no, not really. You got to understand, I don't buy most of the stuff I make videos of. I get it either given to me or I find it in the trash. I don't go out buying vintage computers. Um, I, uh, I started creating, a, doing a rant on that, um, but I, I gave up on it because it was getting pretty bad. Um, <laughs> so, let's take a look on the inside at the uh, machine with the lid open. Enough of the exterior, let's get into the business end of this laptop. It has a very nice keyboard for a sub-notebook. Now, as I was saying, sub-notebooks are compromises in a box. Um, they're intended for one purpose and one purpose only, to make portable computing possible and tolerable. Um, they were never intended to replace laptops um, or to be used solo. Most early sub-notebooks 
or we're, we're going to call them pre-netbook compact laptops, um, were intended to be used in conjunction with another computer or used with a docking station. Oh, another example I just thought of. Apple actually made one that they would never acknowledge today, I'm sure. That was the PowerBook Duo series. If you ever get a chance to look up the PowerBook Duo, I highly suggest you do that. They were very cool machines with really cool motorized docking stations. Very neat. Um, I've had a few over the years. Um, I never really liked them, but they're cool. So back to the HP. Screw Apple. Let's talk about the HP. Um... It has a beautiful, oh, what size would you call that, 12-inch, uh, 12, 12 maybe, TFT display, uh, 800 by 600 resolution. Unfortunately, it only has enough video memory to support 256 colors um, at 800 by 600. If I lower it to 640 by 480, it looks like shit, but I'll have all 16-bit color. Um... Hmm. So I would estimate that it probably has about one megabyte of video memory. I think to support 16-bit color at 800 by 600, you probably need about two megs, somewhere around there. But yes, as far as sub-notebooks go, this has one of the best keyboards I've ever seen. It also has a very nice tactile feedback. It's a little rough, but... You know, when you press a key, you damn well press a key. You you feel it. Boom, boom. Click, click, you know. Click, click. A... Ignore that. But anyway, the keyboard does have an... It's a rubber dome keyboard. I can feel that much. Um, yeah, definitely a rubber dome keyboard. Um, but it does the job. We have function keys. Uh, function F1 through F5 are preset. Uh, wings at the start menu, opens up folder, system toolbox, figure that in a minute, security, battery, something like that, and I believe that is uh, my computer. So, um, brightness controls are right here on top, and I have a surprise for you when we turn this on and bring it up to a Windows uh, menu, because this has the worst the absolute worst internal pointing device of any laptop I have ever used, and I've used thousands. I've used every pointing device except for the ISO bar, and if you don't know what an ISO bar is, look it up. It's cool. I've used every single pointing device. I've used trackballs, track pads, track sticks, AccuPoints, um... Trackballs built into display housings. I've used trackballs that clip to the side of the machine. I've used trackballs that were built into the front of the keyboard. I have used tiny trackballs built into the front of keyboards. I have used, um, golly, uh, what else have I done? I've used mice, of course. Um, touch screens. What other pointing devices have, have been invented over the years that I've used? Hell, I've used them all. I've used the magic pad. I've used the magic mouse. I've, I've used them all. And I have yet to find one that is as horrible and horrifyingly terrible. And I mean this is the worst, absolute, I am I emphasizing this enough, pointing device that some crackpot engineer came up with, I can't imagine how fired he was when this thing hit the streets. It was so freaking terrible. <sighs> that felt good. That, that really felt good, guys. I, you know, it's not every day I get to express that much hatred towards a pointing device. As a matter of fact, it was this pointing device and its horrifyingness that didn't make sense. Uh, hor hor let's just re restructure that. And it's horrifying uh, disusability, just screw it, um, that made me want this machine in the first place because I knew it would make excellent YouTube material. It's so freaking bad. Let's turn the sucker on. Before we get into Windows, we're going to use or get into the system BIOS. I'm going to show you what the BIOS menu looks like. It has a BIOS state of 8.2 of, of, of 96. I, I missed it. Damn it. We'll get right into Windows. 
I am running it on the power brick because the battery is iffy. It does hold a charge, like I said, but not like I'd like it to. So here we are booting Windows 95 Plus. You can see right there it's a Pentium 133. Okay. There's the built-in business audio making all that noise. Makes it pretty cool. I mean, sub notebooks were very compromised, and to have one in the mid '90s that st that actually had a sound card was was actually kind of cool. So the keyboard was a high point, and as I've um, in that last tirade, I've I think I've emphasized how bad the built-in pointing device is. So your first question will be, well, where is it? I don't see anything there. I don't see. It. Where is the pointing device? I don't see shit. Well, it's accessible. Now, this is cool. i got to say, this is cool how they did it, but... My God. Ugh. All right. Press the button that looks like a mouse. Pretty self-explanatory. Boom. There it is. Okay. Here's our mouse. This is our pointing device, and it is... It is, it is terrifyingly bad. It opens up, so you can actually use it like a mouse. You can hold it like a mouse. But look at that black stick that is connected. Look at that. It's tethered. It can't go anywhere. What the hell? What What is this shit? I'll tell you what this shit is. It uses um, uses a resistance strip. There might be a term for that. Like a carbon strip to measure y x and to measure x-axis, and y-axis is measured internally or encoded through a similar mechanism in, inside the machine. So it uses a series of, of, of contacts that drag along the strip with, with resistance that goes from high to low, kind of like the gas gauge in your car. It's, how, it's actually how it works, similar to that, only it's better. Um, so this strip of plastic, which I can pull out, is coated with a, uh, a, a, uh, a material that is conductive. And it's coated on both sides. And it's measuring the resistance from here to here. And as that resistance increases, it moves the cursor over. It's, it sounds good on paper, but in reality, it wears out. And boy, does it ever. Um... I would say this probably has a lifespan of about maybe three or four years before it starts to really flake out. And um, and then you're wondering, well, how do the mouse buttons work? Well, they work similarly. Um, this actually has... Let me try to pull out the multimeter and see if we can't figure that out right now. I just happen to have one. And you know what? I could be wrong on all accounts. I could be actually dead wrong. So I'm going to... I'm going to prove that. I, this is all speculation at this point. We're going to check for resistance on these tracks here, which there is none. Okay, so I'm probably wrong. I'm, I'm dead wrong. All right, so maybe it doesn't work like I thought it did. All right. But it sure does look like it. All right, well... How do the mouse buttons work? None of these are conductive. So I don't know. I guess I don't know. I really don't. Well, in either case, I'm wrong on the mouse button front. Um, I don't know how the mouse buttons connect to the to the uh, logic board, but I do know that there is an X and a Y sensor, and when that sensor wears out, because it's actually mostly flex cables in there now, um, it starts to perform quite erratically. So let's start from A to B. So let's demonstrate this mouse. Okay. I was actually wrong on the concept of how it worked. 
I just verified that with my multimeter. So it turns out that there is um, there are some some kind of a measuring device that determines the position of this mouse in relation to the computer, um, and it's done through mechanical means rather than optical. It's also done, uh, or it, it's it's composed of, and I had this apart a few years ago when I was originally going to buy it. There's a series of flux cables that are prone to wear and tear and breakage. And when that happens, this becomes almost unusable. In fact, it's about there right now. But right now it's behaving okay. But as I start using it, the performance becomes, see, it's doing it right there. It just it started jumping as I'm moving the mouse over to the right, to the, to the left. And it wouldn't move. It wouldn't behave. They did it again. So if I'm trying to get to the Internet Explorer, there it goes. Perfect. Perfect example. We got, it, we got it right in that sweet spot where it doesn't want to work. See? It's running away. It's running away from Internet Explorer as it should be, as I should be. But if that was something I needed to get my job done, I'd be furious. Really furious. But that's the kind of crap I'm talking about. This is a terrible pointing device. Maybe when it's new it's okay. But as it starts to age and wear out, it just doesn't do the job anymore. Fortunately, the buttons seem to be working okay. But if you get it to a certain point, the buttons don't work anymore. There's other implications with this pointing device. Let's say you are on an airplane. And they give you that that enormous cup of, uh, of 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 soda, that's all of two ounces. And you have that thing on your tray. You got your peanuts, right? Well, you're not going to have any room to manipulate this pointing device or this excuse for a pointing device. It's going to be very difficult for you. Um, furthermore, you can't use it in your lap because it's got this stupid flexible piece of plastic there. So you can't use this in your lap. I mean, it's just going to be in the way, and it's going to break off. It's a bad day when your mouse breaks off. It's just a, just a bad day. Or some, some guy sits next to you, like Forrest Gump or some shit, and he reaches over, and he says, I got your mouse. You know, come on. Please, 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 HP. You could do better than that. In, in, 19, in 1996... Almost everyone who was making a compact laptop for usability and portability was including an AccuPoint device, like right there in the middle of the keyboard. Think IBM ThinkPad, Toshiba Satellite, um, Compaq LTE. Was, they started doing that too in about 96 or 7. I mean, AST was doing that. LHP came up with this piece of shit. I mean, come on. They could have done better. This is HP we're talking about. They weren't compact slaves yet. Actually, were they? Did they buy Dell or? Did, I mean, uh, did they, I think this was no compact acquired deck and then eight HP or some shit. But anyway, and you can hear it clunking inside there, like it's like it's like just floating in there, doing you know, just doing whatever you know. It's the most imprecise piece of crap I've ever used. I, I had this sitting on my desk at work, and I'm trying to, uh, I, I, I was trying to, like, look up the system specs, you know, hard drive size and such, and, um, oh, yeah, and you have to kind of recalibrate this every five minutes, and then it loses it, and then it starts jumping, and I'm like, oh, I can't put into words how much I hate this pointing device. Maybe, maybe when it was new, and it was a new idea, maybe people enjoyed it. But that's okay. You can plug in a mouse, right? Hmm. Yeah. You have to use up the one empty, the one COM port it has. So, if you want to hook up a mouse, say you're in a hotel room, and you've got a portable serial uh, modem, right? Because everybody has those. And uh, you want to use a mouse with it, right? Because there's no, there's no PS2 port, so you can't hook up an external mouse, PS2 mouse. You have to use a serial mouse. But if you have a modem that you need to use in the hotel room, well, you can't. 
Sorry, you can pick one or the other. They would have made this machine more usable if it had an, ex, um, an available PS2 port. I just That's just my personal opinion. But, you know what? It has SCSI, so that's, that's, that's damn cool right there. I'll give it points for having SCSI, but I'm going to deduct those points for having this damn mouse thingy, sticky out thing, piece of crap, junk. Come on. I want to look up the... I want to find out what kind of... Um, SCSI device, that is. iOmega Parallel Port Zip Interface. Really? Apparently that's what it has. Hard disk controllers. Let's see what's... See, I'm trying to pull this over. Come on, you junk mod. IDE. IOMEGA Parallel Port Zip Interface. That's what it's called, I guess. And it's... It is not available. I don't know. Why is it not working? Is it, It's not disabled. So what the hell? Come on! Stop it! In another video, we're going to disassemble this machine and kind of go over what it's, uh, how is that working? How is that put together? I want to find out. I can't get, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. It's just pissing me right off. I have, um, I have a mouse upstairs I could probably try, but now I can't, now I can't shut it down. It won't let me get to that point. I downloaded the service manual for this machine, and it has like an entire chapter dedicated to mouse issues. That's how reliable it was, even when it was new. Hmm. In every, almost every bullet point, mouse is doing this, bring it in for service. Mouse is doing that, bring it in for service. Like, seriously, HP, you screwed up. I'm going to shut this thing down. So I wanted to show you this, too. I have this external Panasonic SCSI CD-ROM drive. Um, 4X, pretty cool. I use this with my PowerBook 170. Um, I don't have the right cable to connect it to this Omnibook, but it would support it. As a matter of fact, a couple of the Omnibooks that I saw for sale on eBay, at least one of them, had one of these with it. It was the exact same unit. Um, but it would just plug right into the uh, to the SCSI port in the back. Um, there is a cable available that will connect this to that, um, probably with a few adapters or so. I think there's actually a direct cable for that very purpose, and I'll have to um, I'll have to try to find one. But I think I'm going to just keep this one as a novelty. I'm not going to use it for anything. It's just going to sit on a shelf uh, because I think it's cool. I think it's a, a great milestone in the um, development or the evolution of lap of the laptop as we know it. Um, it's just one stepping stone. It was HP's very last sub notebook and HP actually prominently features this machine in their museum. For what it is, it is very innovative. It's very powerful for its size and for the, uh, for the era that it was built. It's a very powerful machine and when docked, could be used as a full-featured desktop. Um, but I, I actually think it's cool. And that mouse was, when it was functional, way back when, it was a very unique and interesting take on porting portable pointing devices. On that note, I'm going to end this video. Thank you for watching. And uh, if you happen to have one of these uh, that you want to part out that has a good mouse unit, I would love to talk to you. Send me a private message. Um, or if you happen to have one of those as a, as a new old stock service part, the whole assembly, internal and external, I'd love to talk to you. Um, I'd like to restore this machine to its former glory because I think it's, uh, I think it's very cool. So thanks for watching and, um, and have a nice, have a nice, uh,